hello, good afternoon, good evening, six o'clock actually. Let me turn you up a little bit. Actually, not even six o'clock. I'm super early being prompt today. 5.59. So I've pinned the comment on what we are talking about today. Hello for joining everybody. Hello, hello. Thank you for joining. So it is our midweek menopause madness talk um, with Dr. Menopause Care, the amazing Naomi Potter, Dr. Naomi. Um, she is an expert in perimenopause and menopause um, and I think it's really important just to get this information out there. It is a minefield. We're all on a very individual, varied journey um, and it can be really bloody expensive. So I wanted to get some amazing people on that we could talk to weekly um, to pick their brains so that we can save a lot of money and we can kind of figure out what is going on with us because we do feel quite hideous when we're going through this stage. Let me see, is Naomi here? Let's have a look. Okay, I'm gonna wait for her to request. Um, some of you have sent me questions already. I've written them down, um, but it is a minefield, like I said, and it's a very personal journey that we're all on and um, we can feel quite alone when this is happening to us and completely kind of having an out of body experience. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about my experience with um, perimenopause, what I'm going through at the moment, the medication that I'm on. Um, and then we're gonna to speak to Naomi as well and she is gonna be here to answer all our questions. So let's see, I'm probably doing something wrong here. Oh, there she is, okay. Ba, ba, ba. Midweek menopause madness. We're just having a little bit of fun with it. There she is. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. How are you doing? I am good. I'm really good. How are you? Good, thank you. Yeah, yes. all good. Yeah. Lovely to have you on. Thank you so much um, you for tackling this, this topic that has been taboo for so many years. But I think the more and more we're talking about it, it is giving us all that knowledge and that power to kind of know the different avenues we can go down. Because like I said, it's a very personal, very, very varied journey for all of us. Um, and you are an expert in this field, <laughs> which is great. For the last nine years, right? Say that again, sorry? For the last nine years, you've been an I've been, it's been ramping up. Yeah, I've been doing more and more of it. In the, yeah, I mean, as a GP, you see you see menopause coming in and out of your office, but it's really been, yeah, in the last nine years that I've really taken much more of an interest in it. And now it's all I do. Yeah, and you contacted me through Instagram. This platform is great for things like that. So I'm really excited that we've connected and that we can do these chats. And hopefully we're going to do them every week so we can kind of <laughs> delve in a little bit deeper and get some more information um, yeah. And if there's any blokes out there watching um, and you're thinking this isn't for me, it is for you because if there's any women in your life, your mum or your partner or your sister or anybody, um, I think knowing what is going on with them will really help the relationships and, you know, maybe you can pass on some information to them. So knowledge is power for all of us, men and women. Um, so let's just start with... Um, the kind of the first telltale signs that something is going on. I think it varies. Again, this is varied, so, isn't it, in everybody's yeah. what, what it would you say? So much, it varies so much for everybody. But I think one of the common myths is that it's period stopping that people look out for, when actually that can be one of the last things to happen. And it's what is missed by women and also missed by doctors is that, so if, if, if you're asked if you're still having regular periods and then it's automatically, well, you're not perimenopause and that's not the case. So symptoms can be so varied. And I suppose if I could say what the most common earlier symptom is, it would be anxiety, actually. It would be kind of that um, slight kind of dread or impending doom or waking up in the middle of the night with that horrible feeling and you don't quite know you can't pinpoint why and um and it's often come out of the blue in women who've got no history of anxiety or depression and it's really frightening and they think that you know something horrible is going on or that they're going mad um so those those symptoms can creep in 
earlier and I think they tend to although I don't think there's any evidence of it but from my experience it seems to be in young women so in their early 40s and that te that seems to be what is um one of the earlier signs or one of the earlier symptoms I mean, there's so many comments coming in and it's just literally it's it's hideous what us girls have to go through I mean there's a plethora of stuff coming through it's like brain fog and you know anxiety like you said that feeling of like almost panic when you wake up in the middle of the night and you feel like something really awful has happened and you're just like <gasps> and you're just like what is wrong with me and I think so for me anxiety was definitely one of the first symptoms and also depression um yeah. I started feeling really quite low and I just didn't know what was wrong with me and so your first instinct in that case is that you need to go to the doctors and you need to get some antidepressants and I think that if you were to go to the doctor in your 40s and you did say you're feeling really down and really depressed and really anxious they probably would try and put you on yes. antidepressants that would be their first port of call um is, is that your experience and that that is what a lot of women come to me having said has happened to them is that they 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 feel, they, they feel depressed and they feel anxious, but they also feel that it's not straightforward depression. And they have that sense that it's something else going on, but only you kind of know how you're feeling. And it's quite hard to get that over to a doctor. And doctors are used to seeing depression all the time and used to giving antidepressants a lot. You know, it's, it's definitely quite a high proportion of their workload. And so automatically that tends to be what happens but it's not the first line treatment, you know, HRT, you know, replacing the depleting hormones is the first line treatment. And um, it's just kind of making people a bit more aware of that. It would save a lot of heartache, I think. It really would, because I think that um, traditionally 51 is the average age of a woman going through um, perimenopause or is that men that's perimenopause? That's, that's when you're perimenopause. That's but it, I mean, I think I was, about 44 when my anxiety crept in like crippling anxiety where things that I used to be able to do I couldn't do jobs yeah. that and, you know for me I'm working in tv I'm working in like radio it's like stuff that well I have to go to work and I have to on a quite a public platform do stuff but you yeah. know I would just get this like sweats like just sweating like the whole of the back of my hair would just be soaking wet um my periods were very erratic and very painful that was another sign I'd say, was that my cycle was never at 28 days. It started to get kind of every two weeks, sometimes yeah. every three weeks, like it was all over the place. And I think that that was another telltale sign that I, I think looking back, um, yeah, you absolutely. know. And the other thing um, is to, to do with things like the brain fog and the concentration and word finding. And those are really important at work that you can't function and you women yeah. lose jobs. Over it. They lose jobs over it. They resign over it. And it, you know, it's awful. I, 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 you know, often they're at the peaks of their careers and all of a sudden they can't do the job that they've been doing for 20 years. And it's, it's, yeah, it's just awful. It's debilitating. But, it's absolutely debilitating, yeah. isn't it? Um, and then obviously then you've got to contend with the lack of sleep, like the waking up in the night with not only the anxiety, but the hot sweats as well, um, which. And oh they can God. make each other worse. So, so yeah. you, <laughs> so you yeah. sleep poorly and then, and because you're having hot sweats and then you're tired the next day and then you get more hot flushes and night sweats. And then it's just, it's just can be a vicious cycle. You're just going around like this and then you need more coffee and then that makes you more anxious. And then you start <laughs> having flushes more and then you're just like, Oh my God, what can I do? And it's like everything that you kind of, that you go to, to kind of like try and, pick you up with the coffee right i'm going to be finding this presentation i can do this i can take the kids to do this 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 and this i've got it you just can't <laughs> then the coffee no. like impacts the anxiety then you can't sleep at night so what to, to talk us through what is going on in the body when all of these, these things are happening the brain fog the anxiety the sweats the night sweats the peeing all through the night <laughs> i don't understand what's going on talk us through the sort of dips and the ebbs and flows of the different hormones and what they do that's kind of what it is so so up until you're, so this is kind of speaking for the average woman. So some women go through this much earlier, but kind of generally speaking, at the, even as early as the beginning of your 40s, things start to change. Your ovaries just start to not work in the same way as they used to. Um, so a hormone in your brain sometimes, you know, kicks out a bit more hormone saying, come on ovaries, do your job, kick out some more estrogen. And they kind of 
they sputter a bit like an engine does. So they'll kickstart and they'll, and they'll squirt out a bit of hormone and then they'll go a bit quiet again. And you get this hormonal fluctuations that mean actually for a few months you feel okay. And then for a few months, things go a bit, you know, less okay. Um, and it just goes a bit like that throughout your, normally throughout your 40s. And because you have estrogen receptors everywhere, you feel symptoms in, you, you can feel symptoms in really most organ systems. So estrogen can affect literally your head, you know, top of your head to the tips of your toes. So hair, skin, eyes, chest, stomach, muscles, joints, weight, um, urinary tract, you, you, you know, you, brain, emotion, um, oh you, know, you name it. <laughs> You name it, it's... Um, I haven't even got on to the weight right. gain situation. The weight gain is absolutely, like, I mean, really, it's so unfair, isn't it? I mean, it's massively unfair. Like, for me, the, it was very painful periods. Um, I've also got endometriosis and adenomyosis, which I know is makes periods even worse but they were very erratic they were really heavy like heavy beyond heavy like literally bleeding through everything it was just awful and also couldn't get out of bed like couldn't get out of bed like the most pain ever then i started putting on weight and it wasn't all it wasn't like um all over your body where you just felt i felt quite um puffy do you know what I mean? Yes. Like puffy and sort of bloated everywhere. So that was hideous. Um, boobs, my, like beyond my, my sore and swollen. Huh? Am I glitching or you're, Ooh, you're just going in and out the of band We're having bad Wi-Fi. Oh, I'm so sorry. I think it's probably me. I've gone to I've, 4G. Me too. I've totally gone to 4G. I don't know what's going on, but it's just... <laughs> this You're is like a now. menopause situation. Yeah. <laughs> You're not spinning anymore. <laughs> I think it's probably me. I do apologise. Um, wait, I don't know where weight. we were. I think we were talking weight. about weight gain. Yeah, yeah. And it's just so cruel because your your body fat is redistributed from um un, you know underneath your the skin in your face and your arms and your legs centrally, and so that what kind of gives you part of your bone structure um and you know is is diverted and that's why women end up being a little bit more apple shaped as they as they get older. I mean, it's just horrible, isn't it? It really is. I mean, I, I, so I went to the doctor and I went to, um, funnily enough, I've had two male doctors, which thinking back, I mean, there's great male gynecologists, but I think in a sort of situation like this, it just feels like you'd need like a woman who'd be a bit more sensitive <laughs> because it is quite a tricky, um, subject. I remember him asking me about, um, how I felt about the fact that I was going to practically be going, I'm going through the, you know, have perimenopausal basically and how the fact that I wouldn't be able to have kids and, uh, and that I'm getting old. I mean, he literally said those words to me, like, so you're getting old, uh, you're not going to be able to have kids. And I just felt like this lump in my throat. Like I was just like, you know, all these things, of course, as a woman, you, you, do, you I mean, really, of course I know these things. This is something that I have to deal with on a day to day so I already knew these things but for somebody to sort of say it in such a kind of cold-hearted way it literally just choked me up so much so you know you really do need that empathy you do really need somebody to look at the overall situation and, and almost you know be a therapist in that situation as well you know because it's really hard as a woman you start to feel invisible you start to feel really overweight you start to feel like stupid because you've got brain fog you can't sleep there's all this stuff that's going on um and it can be a really lonely place you start to feel not sexy don't even want to talk about the lack of libido um you know it's all going on um can everybody so see us okay are you are you clear because you're a little bit foggy Naomi and I don't know if that's me or if it's you it's probably me I've got terrible wi-fi foggy foggy looking or foggy, foggy looking. sounding <laughs> let's not use the word foggy because we're talking brain fog I can see I can now see and hear you perfectly okay fine 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 um so 
what would you do then when somebody comes to you? Because do you need to, so what are the stages that you would suggest somebody needs hormone replace, replacement therapy, HRT? I think it, it depends on, it depends on age and it depends on the severity of symptoms. So um, if you, if you are having symptoms that are interfering with your life, I would definitely seek help because you shouldn't have to put up with it and it's most commonly it's very easily sort outable and then I would definitely reach out to your GP and you know ask ask their advice about starting hormones which would be the first line treatment if you are if you are over the age of 50 or even over the age of 45 you don't have to have hormones it's it's a personal choice and um you know some women choose not to and some women choose to if you're young, so if you're under the age of 45, but certainly under the age of 40 and you are having symptoms, it is really important to have those hormones replaced, for basically for bone protection and cardiovascular heart protection. Um, so it is that there is no risk involved in treating younger women with hormones and it is, it's a really important thing to do. It's becomes, I mean, you, of course you can choose not to, but I would never advise somebody to not have their hormones replaced unless there was some underlying reason, most commonly be breast cancer, to not have them replaced. But otherwise, almost invariably, you would try and replace somebody's hormones young. Because from my experience, talking to lots of women, they haven't had a very good um, reaction going to their GP. It hasn't been very forthcoming in... Even if they do blood tests, they say, oh, yeah, you're within that range, so you're absolutely fine. And so you sort of come away and you're like, but that didn't help me. You know, I'm, I'm and so it, it's a little bit tricky. And um, and I was, I, I went private. I, I went private. I was lucky enough that I was just like, okay, I'm going to throw some money at it because I don't think that I can put a price on how much better I know I'm going to feel if I get the right yeah. medication. Um, but that's not for everybody. You know, you want to be able to go to your GP and say, like, help, I'm really struggling. Like, help me. It's, it, is re it is really hard. And I, and I think most of, my, most of the patients that come to me have been to their GPs first um, and struggled to get what they've needed. And I think most of it comes from the fact that the training and menopause training is rubbish for doctors. Like, you do practically zero, certainly none at medical school, um, even doing obs and gynae training, you can do very, very little of it. And in certainly general practice training, you have to elect to do it. You, you, would, you could easily go through a whole general practice training without doing any menopause training at all. And the other reason is that there were those big studies that came out about 18 years ago that frightened the life out of everybody. Doctors, patients, doctors were scared about giving patients breast cancer, patients were scared about having breast cancer. And there's just been a massive hangover effect for so from both and both of those reasons I think make doctors still nervous about prescribing it. And I had a patient today who um, went to her GP, who was a woman in her fifties, and she was absolutely point blank not giving not giving her HRT, and then won't prescribe it either. It, it, it's just it just needs it needs to change. And I, actually. Even in the last couple of years, I think it has changed. There is more awareness, mm. but by no means. I mean, menopause is just as common as high blood pressure and high cholesterol and diabetes. And all of those, all of those things are done relatively well. And, you, you know, doctors are educated in, and yet menopause isn't. And it's just bonkers, absolutely bonkers. But it, I hopefully mean, this will help. Yeah, like doing talks like this and people knowing that, you know, we'll sort of... Not taking no for an answer, I think, as well, is like pushing back, even changing your GP, like just trying to change that, you know, whoever you speak to, just say like, actually, no, I, I need to come back. Like I, this, I can't take no for an answer because it's just not acceptable. You know, we shouldn't have to feel and look and not recognize ourselves when we look in the mirror. You know, we're already getting older as it is, but then all these other things that come with it. And, you know, yes, vanity, weight gain, you know, losing, but it's the aches and pains. It's the, it's that physical, I can't get out of bed feeling. I don't want to get out of bed feeling it's you know it's it's the not sleeping it's all of that and how that impacts on our lives it's the not being able to have a glass of wine because <laughs> because it changes i mean my god can we just have about... a big impact on your life can't it i was again i was joking about that with a patient today she said i can't i can't even 
like drink a glass of wine and and, and we found <laughs> ourselves talking about ways of being able to make sure that she can because actually it's life's pleasures isn't it it's you know having a glass of wine in the evening it's not like i'm saying yeah go and have three bottles but yeah just being able to enjoy a glass of wine if you want one it's quite it's quite important yeah it, it really is and all the things that you sort of like even having like you know like some biscuits or some sugar it's things like that really do um i notice uh in make my flushes increase a lot you know the sugar the booze if i've had a couple of glasses of wine that night's sleep won't be that good no. so now i have to be like oh, is it really worth it yes. oh no i just won't drink because sleep is so much more important to me so why does that happen i think it's i don't really know or i don't think anybody really understands the alcohol metabolism thing it just seems to be that as you get older or certainly it doesn't seem to affect men in the same way but as women get older their tolerance often just decreases and they tend to they, they report that they feel the effects faster and the effects kind of harder and then the headaches and the hangover the next day are you know are, are just not not worth it um your metabolism definitely changes and it's, it'll be a number of different pathways um, that, that will be affected. Um, and that's why, you know, your, your metabolism of sugar changes, your metabolism of fats change. Um, and that's, I think that's why you have kind of insulin surges and cravings and you know, particularly cravings for, for sugar. Yes. And, and it's also why fat distribution changes, cholesterol changes. It's, um, Oh, yeah, God. estrogen is the most phenomenal hormone. It really is. But when you lose it, that's when um, that's when you kind of feel it. So your bone density, that's when osteoporosis can kind of creep in. It's like brittle bones, the skin texture changes, the muscle tone, like you said. So like yeah. upping things like collagen and making sure you're, you know, drinking lots of water. And, you know, like I think food uh, can massively help. Um, I switched to a bit more of a plant-based diet and that really does change a lot of things as well, I think, yes. you know, sort of, and also if you're having any sort of meat, um, making sure that it is hormone-free as well, trying to get organic meat and things like that. Little things that you just, just taking more care and just um, trying you to get... You can't get away with, you cannot get away with eating rubbish. You can't get away with not looking after yourself because it shows and you feel it. Absolutely. Oh you my can't God. Cheat, can't cheat. <laughs> so what would you what would you do if somebody sort of was to do a consultation with you um would would you have to, to do the blood test or would you sort of look at the overall um lifestyle of that person and sort of try and gauge what you think they need from just chatting to them on a consultation what i normally do is so i would see somebody and for about the first 15 or 20 minutes, I just let them talk because they've normally got a big story to tell and they've normally you know, been down various avenues and, and often tried different things. And I think they find it quite kind of therapeutic, just, just telling their story because they've often not had the chance to do that before. And then typically in women over the age of 45, they don't need to have bloods to make a diagnosis because the history tells this history tells the story and if they wanted to try hormones straight away then then you can you don't need to have blood tests to confirm it if you and, and that's another kind of bugbear that women have with their with their doc with their gps is that their gps often send them for blood tests and those blood tests often come back normal because they can be normal because you're just a snapshot in time and then they're refused um, but really they they're not massively helpful in making that diagnosis over the age of 45 under the age of 45, then the recommendation is to do bloods before you start treatment normally. And that is to exclude other causes and, and also to see if you have got, particularly women under the age of 40, an early, a very early menopause diagnosis, a POI um, diagnosis. And then it's really important. That's like I said before, it's really important to treat. So bloods, not necessarily, but sometimes. And, and then they can be useful further on down the track when, when after you've started on hormones to see, um, whether the, see whether the patient's symptoms correlate with how well they're absorbing and you can use the blood test to look to see how much hormone that they've got circulating. And that's quite useful. So they're, they're, they're definitely useful, but not absolutely essential. Okay, that's really interesting because I think a lot of people, I'm sorry I had to turn the comments off, but it affects the Wi-Fi and there were so many questions coming in. I will turn them on in a minute so you can ask Naomi some questions and I will tag Naomi and I'm also going to put this up on my um, main grid so you can watch it back or if anybody needs to revert back to it. Um, it's really interesting because you just think straight away that I'm going to need to get 
blood tests and that also is expensive like if you're going not with your gp but if you're going privately that's another like three four hundred quid and it's just like you end up just being like oh my god and then you've got to pay for the prescription so you know it is a little bit of a it's just you know it's it's really tricky it really is tricky. Yeah. but but i, I guess often give, i often give my patients a choice about bloods and say you know they they haven't absolutely got to have them done and sometimes their gps will do them for you know do them for them and some of the bloods that i do are screening bloods things like vitamin d b12 folate iron and again it's it's up to them if they want to spend the money to have those results or not um and the same with the hormones that i can i can judge based on their symptoms um it is quite useful to have them as a you know as a kind of backup or a, oh well that doesn't that doesn't quite match up what else is going on here um but yeah if you're i mean it it, it can it can add up the blood certainly can add up yeah i mean i'm on um so i so first of all my periods sort of stopped and so i then started taking progesterone cream only the cream and it comes like this in a little pump um and i'm take it twice a day i rub it onto my body that's kind of this is the hrt but it's the body identical hormones so that there's with i think what we should do is next week maybe get onto the hormones because yeah. there's so much information isn't there to kind of take in and i find it you know a little bit of a <laughs> it's tricky to take it all in so maybe we'll touch on that next week but i totally have no qualms with discussing what i have taken and what i am taking and actually it doesn't always massively work straight away for me. It takes a little bit of time to get into your system and then there's a little bit of tweaking involved and maybe you need a little bit more of this. But what I would say is if there's anybody considering speaking to Naomi or going to your doctor, maybe start writing down a kind of like a diary of like what's happening, the foods that impact the sweats, the night sweats, the peeing all through the night, the, the pains, the aches. Start sort of like making a note of everything so that when you do um, get a virtual consultation with whoever, you've got all of the information to hand. Can I, um, would you suggest that that's the right thing to do? Uh, yeah, definitely. The other useful thing to do, I think, is, um, so if you're, going to, if you're going to your GP and you're anxious about it, is take somebody with you. Um, so somebody that knows what you've been going through and um, is happy to kind of perhaps talk on your behalf if you feel that you might not quite because it's brain fog and, mem and word finding difficulties and things that can be quite hard to, to in your eight minutes that you've got to get the whole story um, over and if you are booking to, to in with your GP to f try and find the doctor who's got the most experience in okay. women's health because how do you, you do that do you call up when you make your appointment I mean is that what you do yeah, you can just ask. The receptionists normally know. Yeah. Okay. And they'll, they, there's, there's normally, it's normally the, the kind of female partner or female doctor. Um, it's not often the men, the men, but some, you know, sometimes it is. Um, and if there isn't, if there isn't um, somebody named as a women's health doctor, then if they've got, if it's a training practice, they may well have a registrar who's like in their final year of GP training. And they're often the most read up really keen want to know you know want to do the absolute best by all of their patients have a bit of extra time and they're they're normally a good bet to go to that is amazing advice i think taking somebody with you as well because in that moment when you're just a bit like uh, 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 and you're flustered and then you can see that they're already like right so that's it now and you're like no wait i haven't got my point across i'm really struggling so to have somebody there that's like listen this isn't good enough she's not sleeping she's this is happening that's happening so i think that that's really important so having your um partner or your friend or your sister or whoever is in your bubble or whenever we can do these appointments and they're likely to remember what's happened much more clearly than you so they will and you can bounce it off each other when you've left the consultation so you can then discuss what's happened rather than relying on your own memory if you're feeling anxious or worried about going in the first place and it's it's i think it's just a key to a more successful trip um taking someone with you i, I think that's really important um okay i've got some some questions from some of my girls who dm'd me and i've done like a kind of scribble so i hope that i understand what i've written <laughs> so rachel is 50 she has been on HRT for 16 months. Um, the last, she's on um, the estrogel, estrogel or estrogel, I don't know how I'm saying right. And she's on these pills actually, these, um, the eutrogestin, which is the progesterone. So she's been on that for um, 16 months. The last four months, she's feeling more and more exhausted, completely fatigued. She's putting it down to the fact that it's daytime. Um, she's got 12, she does 12 shifts, day and night shifts really long hours she's really struggling what 
do you think she sh do you think she should up she's thinking maybe testosterone should be included into the mix um i know it's hard for you to kind of give her sort of okay this is the magic thing you're missing but like what i think dosage dosage we should definitely be looked at as well as other things like it's very easy to blame everything on the menopause but you know if you are suddenly overcome with tremendous fatigue of out of the blue and you've been stable on something for a long time you do have to think you know could this be something else that's going on so my advice would be to go back to the doctor explain what's been going on there's a possibility that dose might need to be changed so you know you can increase estrogen doses sometimes plus yeah. or minus thinking about testosterone but also look for other things and i think if you think the last four months we've that we've gone into winter you've got that sort of like lack of light so vitamin d could be something that needed our upping yeah. we've had covid yeah. we've had a global pandemic to kind of yeah. get through so there's a lot of different factors if she's thinking yeah. the last four months so that's a really interesting point not straight away blame it on the like my cream's not working <laughs> <laughs> throw it away it can you, it, you do have to, um, I mean, I have to be careful because all I see is menopause and it's very easy for me to say, well, it's menopause, 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 but you do need to think. So whereas GPs need their menopause radar, you know, looking for menopause amongst everything else, uh, you know, menopause specialists need their other stuff, men, other stuff radar, because that can creep in along, alongside absolutely that is that is amazing advice okay so we've got a, a message from vicky on my post-it notes um vicky's 42 her um f fsh levels now is that where you're still follicles you're still producing ovaries so your ovaries are still working you're still producing eggs so it's it's <laughs> it stands for follicle stimulating hormone that's what and it's the it's the it's the hormone that your brain pumps out to tell your ovaries to start producing a follicle which you would then ultimately ovulate and if your ovaries are a bit sleepy your brain has to pump harder so your level goes up and that's a marker of kind of entering perimenopause or menopause and it goes very high after the menopause well, Vicky's um, FS, I can't even say, FSH levels are 65.7. So her, her gynecologist um, told her that she is post-menopause, but she's still having periods. That doesn't make sense. Um, and she's still got loads of symptoms. What should she do? HRT. Um, well, yeah, did her doctor not offer her HRT? No. She said she's post-menopause. She's basically said, your levels are 65.7, you're over the menopause, deal with it. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. So, But you're basically post-menopausal when you've gone for a year without a period. So she's not post-menopausal, she's perimenopausal. And with an FSH that high, she's definitely perimenopausal um ovaries can spring back you know they can so you, you know a repeat fsh in six weeks time may have come down and her symptoms may get may improve but the chances are it will do that you know okay. it'll, um, it'll just fluctuate but um if she wanted hormones i'm not sure why she wasn't offered them because that would probably be the first step unless there was a reason why she couldn't why she couldn't have them doesn't make sense, does it? It really doesn't. Um, hopefully, like talking on, on things like this to get a little bit more information, then we can kind of go, actually, no, it should be here, here, and this. Now, this is a diff this is a tricky one, and I don't really know how. So this is from Annie. So she's on the pill, but the um, perimenopause runs in her family. So like, uh, early, early, per early per uh, um, perimenopause runs in her family. Um, she's getting night sweats, terrible night sweats, she says, and, and changes to her skin. What's the situation with being on the pill and going through any kind of perimenopause? Because obviously it, that's tricking your body into thinking you're pregnant. And so like, how does that work? So there's two different types of pill. There's the progesterone only pill and then the combined pill. Yeah. The combined pill has got estrogen in it. So it can mask symptoms of the perimenopause and menopause. Um, progesterone only pill doesn't have estrogen in it. So that tends to be the pill that most women notice their perimenopause symptoms with. But, but on the progesterone only pill, you often don't have a period at all. Yeah. So it, it sort of stops that. So you haven't got that as a warning sign. You tend to just have the other symptoms. Um, Women on the combined pill often notice their symptoms in a, in a packet break. So if you, if you take a break between packets and you're not taking the extra, extra estrogen, that can be when their symptoms are worse. Um, and that's when they tend to notice it first. But it's definitely possible to, to notice that you're going into the perimenopause while still taking 
the combined pill. Okay. All right. So we need to delve a little bit deeper. And you probably need to contact your GP or to or, or Dr. Naomi Carter um, to find out what pill you're on exactly. I'm going to, I feel like I should open it up to the forum. I should open it up to our <laughs> community to see what's going on. So for those of you just joining us, this is... Um, Dr. Naomi Potter, this is on Midweek Menopause Madness Talk, talking about the madness of menopause and all the different symptoms that just kind of fall on us like a avalanche of craziness and we don't know what's going on. Now, I know there were so many comments coming in um, and we had to turn them off, but do you have any questions for the amazing Naomi? Um, I think what we should do though, Naomi, is just like pick this up again next week. Um, and then I, I think- I not questions at all. You can't see questions. No. Isn't that strange? Oh God, there's so many. Um, and actually what it does is when you do Maybe keep the comments, strange. when you do keep the comments on, it um, affects the Wi-Fi for both of us. So sometimes it's good to have them off. Um, I think what we should do is, oh look, we've got loads of questions. I haven't got my glasses on, I can't read that. <laughs> just came in on that's, that little question mine's just, thing. Mine's just pause with mid midweek menopause madness on it and that's it. That's all you need to know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um it's so funny um okay so i just keep thinking about that lunchtime quickie lunchtime so, quickie you used to do something called lunchtime quickie on your instagram and i was like i really hope that's not you and your husband um but anyway <laughs> <laughs> it's, your, it's your um partner at the clinic nigel um, <laughs> let's just be clear with that but um, yeah, I mean, I think what would be good is perhaps <clears throat> if you guys can DM me any of your questions and what I'll do is I'll print them out and then we can go through them because um, it's quite hard to get through all these questions. Um, is it glitching again? Maybe it's glitching again. I don't know. I can see, I can see you and hear you perfectly, but I, but I cannot see any, I can't see any. Okay. Questions. Well, there's loads of different patches. Somebody went on HRT when she was in her 60s. Somebody's like, talking about... Um, the patch is called Everol. Can you advise about the Everol patches? Everol, Everol patches are good. Um, so one of the things that we didn't talk about was kind of, what well, I guess we can touch on this next week, is um, is roots of delivery. So HRT, so the hormones that, um, or the estrogen that is given in modern HRT should really be through the skin, certainly as a first line, because that's the safest way of, of giving it. And Everol is one way of, of doing that. That's one of the brands. And it comes in different strengths and it also comes in a couple of different preparations. It comes with a, some of them come with a progesterone already included in it, which means it's a really easy way of taking it. Okay. Um, I think that that's what she wanted to know, yeah. And then somebody, Dawn has said, advice for progesterone intolerance and depression. Is, 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 that, is that something that, because a lot of people do say it makes them a bit loopy taking the progesterone. It's probably the biggest um, kind of, hurdle when when you prescribe hrt um it is is, is progesterone sensitivity and it can make you feel kind of pms -y, um a bit anxious or a bit bloated and um there are options so in terms of you know the dose that you give the route that you give um some women get on really well with a morena coil if they're progesterone sensitive so it just it, it it depends so there are options but it is um it is a very very well recognized probably biggest um challenge okay oh my gosh this is so many i think what we should do is we should next week touch on um a treatment plan like what you would suggest for different people with different symptoms at different ages and all of the above and the different like you said the different delivery systems of um taking the hormones so i've got creams i've also got pills there's patches there's all sorts of things going on isn't there and there's different horses for different courses and it isn't a one size fits all at all it is so individual all these journeys that we're going on so i think the more we can talk about it the more it's not a taboo subject um the better the world is going to be it's going to be less and it's a moving target as well, especially whilst you're still kind of in it with, you know, in the perimenopause because your ovaries do suddenly kick out a whole load of estrogen and then they don't and then they do and then they don't. And so it can, it, you can, you, you know, you can be kind of chasing your tail a little bit. Um, but I think as long as we, kind of women accept that it is, it's something that can be tweaked. It's not like it doesn't suit you. It's a disaster. You can never go on it again. Then, then, you know, and you kind of just accept that you might need to change things. Then yeah. they're perfectly workable. 
and then there's also some people that you know we don't want to put pressure on people to think that they have to go down that route of taking any kind of hrt or body identity hormones or anything like that so it's like there's different routes for people some people want to do it more naturally some people don't even get any symptoms they just sail straight through i mean that's yeah. incredible i'm like you are fabulous for that whoever you are um i know two women actually who are just fabulous and have just like no nothing nothing periods are stopped that's it i'm like wow yeah. um and some women find it really liberating you know they you know no no periods no worrying about contraception you know pinnacles of their careers just get on with it and yeah so can you still get pregnant uh, you can when you are perimenopausal yes watch out ladies don't think that you're just like yeah <laughs> mind you we haven't really talked about libido but i i'm like libido what libido where's my libido i've lost my libido <laughs> i'm taking testosterone it's doing nothing for that error in my life so we need to talk um but yeah like i said we've just scratched the surface today there's so much more to talk about but it's been so nice to talk to you you are fabulous thank um you. and thank you ladies you. and gentlemen for joining um i'm gonna add naomi's um instagram handle so you can follow her and she does lots of igtv on on her channel so um yeah let's let's reconvene next wednesday at 6 p.m for more thanks lisa bye, bye. 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 thank you for watching loads of love everybody um sorry i had to turn the comments off it was just getting crazy. Um, and also next time I'm gonna actually bring my glasses with me because that little um, thing down there with the people and the, and the questions, sorry, I didn't get around to doing that. DM me any questions. What I'll do is I'll print them out. So I've got them all printed out and we can tackle them next week. Same time, six o'clock. Let's get knowledge up, girls. Loads of love. Mwah.